Good morning and welcome to John Fredrickson, Legislative Candidate from District 20. Thank you, John, for joining us for our virtual Legislative Candidate meetings. My name is Gina Ragland and joining me today are AARP Lead Advocacy Volunteers, Susan DeCamp, Joyce Beck, and Danny DeLong. Emily Wick is also joining us today to assist with some of the technical details for the program. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared with AARP members across your district prior to the election. John, we appreciate your taking the next 30 minutes of your time to meet and discuss issues of importance to the 50 plus voter and their families in your district and across Nebraska. As background, AARP is the nation's largest nonprofit nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering and strengthening people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. As people live longer, healthier lives, we know we need to think differently about what it means to age. With that, John, if you want to start us off by giving us a little background about yourself and your campaign and thinking about five minutes or less on that, that would be great. Once we've completed your opening, we'll move into the questions. So I'll pass it back to you, John. Welcome. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to speak with all of you. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be, be here today. So uh, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is John Fredrickson. Um, I am running to represent District 20 in the Nebraska legislature. Uh, I grew up here in Omaha, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that I did. Uh, I had a family that loved me, I had a community that really cared about me, um, and I had teachers that really invested in me. Um, after I graduated high school, I went on to college, graduate school, and I studied social work both as an undergrad and graduate students, um, in large part because of the values that were instilled in me growing up in Nebraska, uh, really caring about your community, looking out for one another, and um, inequality before the law. So for uh, a living, uh, I am a, a mental health provider. I have a private practice where I provide mental health services. Um, I do a lot of telehealth these days since the pandemic, which has been really, um, you know, I'm being completely frank, it's kind of surprised me how effective it's been. Um, I was dragging my feet a little bit uh, doing telehealth as a counselor just because so much of it is a, a relational approach. And so I wasn't sure how that was going to go on, on in, in a telehealth setting, um, but it has been really quite effective. Um, and that's, that, that's a huge kind of passion for me in the legislature. So mental health in general, uh, just kind of with my profession and my background. Um, you know, I realized after, you know, when you're a counselor for a long enough period, you sort of pick up on different themes. And it became clear to me that we, we don't currently have any mental health subject matter experts in our legislative body. And I think that that is a perspective that is extraordinarily valuable as it pertains to mental health, healthcare policy, education policy, um, but really any policy that's going to impact a person's day-to-day -day life. Uh, so that's a big passion of mine. Um, Education is also super important to my family. Uh, my husband and I have a three and a half year old son. Uh, so we've got skin in the game uh, with a, we're, we're raising a son here and uh, he will be in our school system as well. So, you know, really wanting to make sure that our teachers feel supported that our schools have the resources that they need uh, so that they can provide for our kids so that all of our kids can graduate with the skills they need to be successful. Um, and the third big thing that I'm super passionate about with this campaign is, is Nebraska's future. And I think we can think about Nebraska's future in a number of different ways. We can look at this from, um, you know, a, uh, an infrastructure perspective. We can talk about broadband expansion. We can talk about, um, you know, workforce issues. We can talk about, uh, you know, climate. Um, and I think all of these are certainly interrelated. Uh, and I think one of the key things we have to do as a state is ensure that we have policies in place that are attractive to young families so that they can attract, retain talent in our state. Um, so that we have a sustainable future, both economically speaking, uh, but also from a cultural perspective as well. Perfect. Thank you, John. Thank you for the background and the bio and most importantly, everything that you're running on. And I do want to thank you personally for all the work that you do in mental health. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, we've seen the sort of that and the need for that even before the pandemic. So thank you for your work on that. Um, John, we provided you with a set of three questions or three issues containing four questions pertaining to the 50 plus in Nebraska. Um, we're looking to, again, a lot five minutes for each of those questions. So our first question this morning comes on health, caregiving and home and community based services. And Susan DeCamp is going to take that. So go ahead, Susan. Good morning, John. Nice to have you here with us. Um, home and community based services, also known as HCBS, provide an array of services to help people 
with their daily living activities, which promotes independence and allows them to stay in their own homes and communities and age in place, um, delaying that time when they have to go into institutional care for long-term care. Um, family caregivers also provide care for someone who is not able to live independently. These caregivers are family members or friends or even acquaintances who often provide this care without pay. And um, I know you mentioned telehealth services, how that has helped in your uh, business. Their uh, telehealth services can be significant to older adults and particularly in rural areas and um, underserved communities. And they can also provide support to family caregivers by reducing travel and wait time and offsetting some of the costs associated with uh, caregiving. So along those lines, we have two questions for you. The first question is, what will you do to support the 240,000 unpaid family caregivers in Nebraska through policies such as enhanced respite services, access to telehealth, caregiver education and training, and help with out-of-pocket expenses? And the second question is, what will you do to protect or expand the home and community-based services program? particularly in the area of recruitment and retention of a sufficient workforce and also adequate funding of the services that Nebraskans and their families rely on. Absolutely, um, super important question and extraordinarily obviously uh, relevant issues to our, to our state today. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I, I, I wanna just kind of underscore how important these caregivers are um, you know, in, in the profession of social work, we, we have a number of core values and uh, some of our core values include ensuring that folks that we are working with have autonomy and self-determination. And I think that that is such an important thing when it comes to dignity, when it comes to respect. And, um, you know, these caregivers, um, you know, members of the community, members of the family, et cetera, really kind of enable and underscore that for, for, for countless uh, Nebraskans. And so it's invaluable um, support uh, that they are providing. Uh, to your point, um, I, am, I am extraordinarily supportive of, um, of this model, but I also am not naive. I think that we have to ensure that the caregivers are also supported themselves. Um, you know, this is difficult work. Um, it's rewarding work. It's fulfilling work. It's important work, but it can also take a strain on folks. And so, um, you know, you mentioned, for example, telehealth. And I, I know I kind of briefly mentioned this in my introductory points, but I'll kind of expand a little bit on that if that's okay, just because, um, you know, this is something that I really feel so passionately about. And uh, folks talk to me a lot. They're, they always ask, you know, what committees are you interested in? And people always assume HHS because of my background. And of course, that is uh, that is an interest of mine just with my uh, personal experience. But I'm also super interested in transportation and telecom, um, specifically from a broadband perspective, because I truly believe that as we move forward, we're going to continue to see more and more hybrid models of healthcare. We're going to see more and more hybrid models of education, more and more hybrid models of um, employment opportunities. And so it's really essential as a state that we, we make sure we have equitable access, um, including you mentioned two rural parts of our state who might not have um, the same um, uh, supportive in infrastructure in place that we, that we might in larger cities like Omaha or Lincoln. So um, I'm a proponent of looking at ways we can expand and increase access to care through telehealth, um, UNMC is doing some interesting work with workforce retention, um, particularly as it relates to behavioral health. And I think this certainly can apply it to, to caregiving as well. Uh, we need to make sure that we are looking at ways to recruit. Uh, sometimes it's educational, so um, helping um, get the word out that this is a career opportunity that's available. Uh, we also need to make sure that when we get folks in these positions that they feel supported. So, um, you know, ensuring that there is, um, you know, appropriate compensation, uh, that people have livable wages, um, and also ensuring that they have access to um, supportive services, whether that's educational opportunities, um, you know, sometimes when, when you're a caregiver and you feel burnt out, sometimes just having someone you can call and say, hey, this has been a really tough day or this came up. I'm not really sure 
what, what to do about this. Um, that happens in counseling all the time when you're a provider. Sometimes you'll work with someone and you're like, I just need to call a colleague or a supervisor that I can just sort of talk this through with. So looking at ways that we can maybe build some of that I don't know if I'd describe it like maybe as like soft infrastructure sort of around, um, you know, home-based care and, and, and support um, so that we can ensure folks feel supported um, and that people are getting the care that, that, they, that, they, um, that they need and, um, and that they have that support available to them. Great, thank you so much, John. Thank you, John. Our second question now this morning, we're gonna shift into nursing facility quality and Joyce Beck is gonna take that. So go ahead, Joyce. Uh, thank you, John, for giving your time to us this morning. Over 20,000 Nebraskans require care in nursing facilities or assisted living communities. Facilities have closed their doors, citing reimbursement challenges and staffing shortages. Nebraska will need an additional 4,700 more nursing assistants, LPNs, and RNs by 2028 to meet Nebraska's care needs. Everyone, regardless of where they reside, deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and have access to quality medical care. Better staff to resident ratios improve the overall quality of care and well being of residents. Workforce recruitment, retention, and job satisfaction challenges are prevalent across long term care services and support industry. Causes of workforce challenges must be identified and implemented to respond to the growing need for high quality care. So John, here's my question for you. What will you do to improve the quality of nursing facility care for Nebraska residents, including addressing the growing long-term care workforce crisis in the state, professional education and training, and accountable facility reimbursement. So again, another really great and important question. I, I the social worker in me is just singing right now because this is <laughs> this is like what I do. So um, uh, yeah, um, you know, we we this is essential, and I I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but having these facilities available, if we do not have strong care available, we will that will be. Um, that, that will be a crisis, you know, and I, I'm trying not to say that dramatically. I, 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 it is a concern of mine. It really is. And so um, reimbursement is huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. When I speak with um, uh, folks in the community, whether it's in uh, nursing facilities, I've heard this from uh, different medical type of uh, facilities as well. Reimbursement rates make all the difference in the world. Um, it is, um, you know, it, it's sometimes it's, um, it feels a bit dry to talk about finances when it comes to this, but, you know, it costs money to provide services and, you know, it, it, you know, we need to ensure that we're also uh, paying livable wages to folks who are in these settings as well. And so we need to take a hard look at ensuring that we are investing in these facilities so that they can provide the level of care that Nebraskans deserve as they age, um, because that is, again, it comes back to a dignity issue, um, regardless of where you live in the state. Uh, you should not be punished if you live in a rural setting versus a city setting. Um, if you live in a city, you shouldn't be punished from capacity issues or shortages. So, you know, we need to really um, uh, think about what, we, what, our, what our values are really, I think is what this kind of comes down to as a society and, and how, we're, how we're investing our, our, our resources to ensure that Nebraskans can age with, with dignity. Um, you, you also mentioned, I think, um, workforce uh, shortages and sort of the crisis in the state. So, you know, this is this is an issue that is, um, it, it, it's universal, right? We're seeing this in the healthcare setting, but we're, we're seeing this across, you know, education, um, business communities as well. And so um, I like to look at this kind of really holistically. And so one thing that I think a lot about is that when we're looking to attract and retain talent in our state, we, we have to ask ourselves questions um, about you know what are what are the things that folks of workforce age are looking for um, in a community to live, right? So uh, folks are going to look for communities that um, if they're parents, they're going to look if they have strong schools. They want to make sure they can educate their kids. Uh, they want to make sure that they can. Um, uh, have competitive wages. They want to be able to, to afford to live. Um, what's the housing market look like, right? Can they afford rent? Can they afford a mortgage um, in that setting? So we need to look at affordability from a housing perspective as well. Um, and, and we also need to look at, 
you know, ways the local government is, is legislating and um, the types of behavior local government is modeling. You know, I think about this all the time with my three and a half year old son, you know, we want to model kindness, compassion, um, you know, and so, you know, creating an environment that is also instilling um, values in our and in, in, in young uh, kids that are uh, values of kindness and compassion as well. Um, I think that's essential and I think it's actually part of the role of government as well to model strong leadership in that sense. And so I think the workforce issue, there's a lot of different ways to tackle it, but I think looking at housing, uh, salaries, uh, culture, schools, uh, public safety, these are all things that I think are going to ensure that we have a sustainable future from that perspective. Okay, well, thank you, John, for your time. Thanks for your answers. Thank you, John, and, and thank you for your passion on these issues. We do really appreciate it. Um, our final question for discussion today comes on, and I, you kind of started to trickle into a little bit of this, but on livable communities and helping people stay in their home. And so Danny Geelong is gonna take that. Go ahead, Danny. Good morning, John. Good to be with you this morning. Um, my question is about helping people stay in their home, as Gina just said. And uh, one of our policy priorities for in AARP is exactly that, helping people stay in their home. The reason for that is that 75% of the people over 50 say that their priority is to age in place. Age in place uh, means to us and, and, and operationalizes as uh, creating livable communities, which you've, you've just done a marvelous job of explaining to us, uh, but I'm gonna go through it too. So uh, a livable community is safe and secure. Uh, it offers affordable housing and transportation options that allow individuals to travel by multiple means. Uh, and it provides supportive community features and services uh, for people of all ages. And two of those services we're focused on today, which is adequate health care, access to adequate health care. And, um, and that would include, I'm sure, mental health care. And then uh, adequate, or I should say, uh, access to high-speed internet. Now, Affordable transit options are critical to support older Nebraskans, especially in rural areas. But sometimes we'll have people from urban areas say, well, it's not just rural areas. Uh, you know, affordable options are, are difficult in transportation because transportation is expensive. Um, High-speed internet, I think we have three criteria for that. High-speed internet should be affordable, reliable, and accessible for all Nebraskans. Digital skills development is a part of, of uh, the high-speed internet infrastructure. Uh, we would call that digital literacy. So there are two aspects to digital literacy. Uh, digital devices, knowing, knowing how to work them, knowing uh, what to buy, and then just negotiating with them, using them for uh, telehealth, using uh, their devices for uh, banking, for shopping, for other sorts of healthcare. Uh, and so he said, digital literacy and as part of high-speed internet um, is critical to a livable community. My question is, what will you do to ensure all Nebraskans, mainly those over 50 plus, have access to livable communities which offer affordable housing, diverse transportation options, adequate health care, and affordable, reliable, and accessible high-speed internet, including digital skills development? So you, you started by talking about kind of aging in place. And I, I think about this all the time about the role that environment plays in a person's autonomy and a person's dignity, all of these things. And that's across the entire lifespan, but certainly as folks age as well. And so um, I, I'm in complete agreement that that is something that we need to prioritize and ensure that people can do so um, safely 
and and um, and to live a life of prosperity in doing so. Um, and so you you kind of went through the whole list of my my usual spiel. It's exactly all those things of of, of what that involves and, and why why that's important. So, you know, specifically um, what I can do is. Um, you are not going to find a stronger advocate for telehealth uh, in the legislature than myself, and I say that because maybe I'll maybe I'll put my foot in my mouth depending on if I get down there and someone else is stronger than me on that. But uh, as a provider myself, uh, I just have that direct clinical experience of, of, of actually offering that service, and so um, and and again, I, I've seen how successful it can be. Um, I actually have a couple of people in my practice now who live in the western part of the state um, that. I, I just would have never been able to offer a service to um, had had this not be an option. So, being a strong advocate for for telehealth is certainly what I I, I plan to do. That, um, you know, I want to also be clear from a clinical perspective. Um, we we want to make sure it's clinically indicated, depending on what the presenting problem is. So, some services, of course, will remain in person, but when we're able to provide telehealth, uh, that, <clears throat> that is something that that uh, we should certainly be taking advantage of. Um, in terms of uh, internet, uh, you know, um, this is an issue that is, again, I think it's it, it's really going to become, in the next you know, decade or so, one of the defining issues of how um, we we look as a country. Frankly, is it's broadband equity nationwide, and so I think we're going to sort of see broadband deserts where folks who might live in these areas that don't have access to high speed affordable internet are not going to have the same opportunities as folks that do have access to that. And so um, we need to be on top of this. Uh, we need to really be proactive in doing all we can to make sure that we have as equitable as broadband statewide as we possibly can um, and as quickly as we possibly can uh, for, for those exact reasons, just for access to healthcare, access to education, access to work opportunities, um, all of these things as we see more and more um, hybrid models available. Um, so. That's also why I'm interested in transfer and telecom. Um, as a social worker and mental health provider, I never thought I would be talking about broadband this much. But uh, the the world has just changed as as so much in my in my career and in how services are offered. And so it's 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 another strain. My husband gives me a hard time because he's like, you, you talk about broadband more than. I think is healthy, and so uh, and maybe that's true. <laughs> but I, I think it's important to kind of keep talking about that, and that's also um, kind of spurs my interest in the transport and telecom um, uh, um, committee as well, uh, because you know obviously they 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 will have a large role, and um, you know we're getting a number of federal funds coming in for for broadband expansion, and so overseeing that and um, ensuring that that's done effectively as well. Thank you, John. We appreciate your your response this morning. Thank you, John. We're now coming to the end of our meeting. I'd like to offer you the final minutes uh, to offer any closing thoughts or comments you might have for our members and the constituents of your district. So I'll give it back to you. We have about five minutes left. So anything else you want to say in closing, go ahead. Well, great. Well, again, thank you so much for, for inviting me today. I, I really appreciated this conversation and um, I really am honored for the opportunity to speak. Um, thank you to all the viewers at home who uh, stuck with us and watched through the entire um, uh, interview here. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, going to be a pivotal election um, this year. Uh, you know, I think we're at a pivotal point as a state in Nebraska, and I think the outcome of our elections in November are really going to have a significant impact on what our state's going to look like in five years, in 10 years, and in 15 years. Um, so I'm really proud to be running a campaign that's really based on looking to our future. How can we invest in a future that ensures that we are a competitive state, uh, that we have a state where folks can thrive, um, regardless of where they live in the state, and ensuring that we have a prosperous future for, for all in Nebraska. So these are big passions of mine. I really hope to earn your support and your votes. You can learn more about my campaign on my website. It's johnfornebraska.com. And you can also reach out to me there if you ever want to chat with me. So thank you again for taking the time to view. And thank you to the AARP for, for inviting me today. Perfect. Thank you, John, again, for taking the time to visit with us. We wish you the best with your campaign. And again, thank you for meeting with AARP today. Take care. Thank Thanks, you. John. Thank you.